is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, I will be talking with an expert on the life of Robert Frost, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Robert Fagan is my guest. He has written about American poet Robert Frost in the past, and we will be talking about Robert Frost the man, Robert Frost the poet, and anything else that comes up in between. So welcome, Robert. Uh, if you could give a little background about yourself and anything that you've written about Robert Frost, it would be appreciated. Yes, uh, I grew up in New York City uh, and uh, attended schools in, in the East Coast. And uh, I've been a, a reader of poetry ever since I can remember. Uh, and uh, in regard to Frost, uh, I first became acquainted with Frost by uh, listening to re LP recording my father had of Frost reading his work. And I was very deeply moved by those those recordings. They had a great effect on me. I, mean, I found his poetry uh, to be uh, uh, a, a tremendous representation of, of uh, human speaking voice and also how evocative some of the mysteries that I felt um, at the heart of uh, uh, the New England landscape, as it were. And uh, I had spent a number of summers up in New Hampshire and Maine as a young boy. And so uh, Frost's uh, representation of New England was uh, of great interest to me. I would also say that, uh, uh, aside from my initials, <laughs> my name, uh, there's something else I have in common with Frost, but also with with other uh, what one might call a pastoral writers, namely that I'm a city a city boy who became very interested in country things, and as you probably know, Frost uh, was actually born in San Francisco uh, and grew up uh, then grew up later in in New England, but uh, uh, country for him was, was uh, something that, uh, with which he's of course associated, was something that he came to, uh, not initially, but later. Um, and so uh, uh, I was very interested in uh, uh, the way maybe a city boy might be in country things and in pastoral life, what I thought pastoral life was. Now, after, uh, uh, in graduate school, um, I decided to write about Frost and science because I uh, uh, Frost seemed to me to be uh, someone who was very preoccupied uh, with science and very interested in science. And as I got into it, uh, I found that, that his relationship to science was very complicated. So I wrote a book on Frost and uh, Darwin called Robert Frost's Challenge to Darwin in which I was able to explore uh, Frost's relationship to Darwin uh, specifically and science in general. Uh, and then I continued working on, on Frost and uh, the idea of the pastoral mode in poetry, uh, and that was some of the impetus behind uh, what I did with the Cambridge Companion to Robert Frost and the Cambridge Introduction to Robert Frost, which I edited and in, in the latter case wrote. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've been uh, uh, very interested in Frost's way of thinking. Um, and uh, I realized that in order to get more deeply into this, uh, that one of the things that would be very useful would be to explore his notebooks, which he didn't destroy, or he did, may have destroyed some of them, but he preserved many of them. And Frost was very good about uh, destroying those things that he had no interest in, in having people see. For example, there are almost no original drafts or manuscripts of his poems. Uh, so uh, I decided to do an edition of the of the poem, uh, rather of the notebooks, uh, and uh, that became uh, a, a, quite a project in itself. Uh, and uh, so I've been devoted to Frost because uh, I think he is uh, one of the extraordinary poets of, in the English language. Uh, so that's the short history of my uh, 
relationship to uh, to Frost, which continues. Well, let me, uh, uh, since Frost's biography is well-known, and as you mentioned, he's probably one of the three or four most well-known uh, poets in American history, we won't spend so much time on his biography. What I do find interesting out of all your works is that you did uh, write about the notebooks and the letters, and I I've often wondered, uh, you know, is this a, a modern kind of, or maybe it's a, an evocation or an earlier kind of celebrity look for people. I mean, nowadays we have reality TV, but looking at the letters of, of Walt Whitman, I did a Walt Whitman show a few months ago and they recently discovered a novel he had written back in the 1840s. Uh, yes. It's almost like trying to understand the person rather than letting the work stand by itself. What is your relationship to Frost, the interior man, versus Frost, the public poet? Well, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I, I think that Frost had a public persona, but uh, I don't think that he was in an insincere man. That is, I don't think it was an act. Uh, some people characterize what he, the way he was in public, particularly after he became famous, and he started to become famous after he returned to England. But by the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, he was extraordinary, early famous. Um, I, I'm interested in the work. And the notebooks are not really personal. The notebooks are not jur personal journals. He, he, there's no dish in them. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's very little in the way of, uh, or almost nothing in the way of daily observations. There's almost nothing about family. Mm -hmm. uh, so that... Um, uh, the notebooks I really see as a complement to his poetry and as a way of helping us understand the poetry better, to understand what some of his preoccupations were. Uh, 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 so I don't see the notebooks as, as being involved. I see notebooks as being involved in his, or is, is, is involved in his intellectual and spiritual life and not so much, you know, uh, about his his public doings. Now, the letters are a little bit different, but Frost, Frost in his letters is someone who is uh, very conscious of himself uh, giving in, in the letters a rhetorical performance. And so the letters are very interesting uh, for what they reveal about, again, how he's thinking, uh, and not, not as interesting about so, his so-called inner or private life. Uh, and there are family letters, and I think one of the things we've learned from the letters is, contra the, the uh, Lawrence Thompson biography, you know, how complicated his relationship was with his children. You know, what, what, a, what, a, uh, what sense we have from those letters of, of what a devoted father he was. Uh, but, uh, for example, the letters contain some of his most interesting writing about the nature of sound in poetry. So uh, he decided, for whatever reason, not to be the kind of essayist that, for example, T.S. Eliot became. Uh, Frost, I think, was reluctant to write essays. And though he did write essays, uh, there are relatively few of them. They're extraordinary. But the letters are often a place where he, he, he allows himself to give vent to some of his ideas, as it were. Mm -hmm. So I also see the letters as part of of our understanding what his, his uh, intellectual and, and related preoccupations were. Well, Frost during his lifetime was sort of considered the sort of outre uh, guy in the modernist movement. I mean, the, the Pounds and the Elliots and uh, uh, even William Carlos Williams and, and those sorts. Uh, he was always looked upon during most of his lifetime as that quaint poet. And then sort of towards the end of his life and the first 20 or 30 years afterwards there came from being quaint Frost to sort of dark Robert. And I think nowadays when I look at him, the thing that I find the most interesting about Frost is he's sort of the misunderstood man of poetry. If I think of numbers of poems that are misread, uh, Frost probably has more poems that are thought to be one thing that are really something else. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But do you have you seen over the course of his life and now afterlife uh, 
this evolution of the different types of fruit because it seems amongst uh, writers of letters and everyone goes up and down uh, in terms of critical reception via uh, you know whoever's the critics of the day but it's not so much critical reception as it is a total perception of what this artist was about well it's complicated in his case because he became such a well-known public figure and uh, this is a, a very complicated set gets into a complicated set of problems um, Ross did need a public persona, there's no question about it. And a little bit of it is uh, the persona of the uh, uh, uh cracker barrel philosopher. Uh, I don't think that that's fully justified if you listen to the recordings of his readings and the things that he says. But uh, uh, I think his the way he looked, especially as he got older, uh, uh, the, the kind of white-haired sage... Uh, uh, the the teller of truths, as it were, uh, uh, that became something that was very pleasing to many many people. And uh, modernism as a movement, you know what Frost called it, movement, and he was very aware of the movement. I mean, he was in England with Pound. You know, he met Yeats. Uh, he kept a kind of diff distance from the, what he called the modernist move, what he considered to be the modernist move. He, he was interested, as he says in his letters, in, in having his poetry reach many, many people. And I think that uh, uh, academics, academic critics, uh, and, uh, are, are suspicious of, of poetry that seems either that clear um, or, or that uh, popular. So, so there's a kind of resistance to Frost uh, just because, I think, of, of, of his immense popularity. Uh, that is a resistance among certain kinds of academic critics. Now, there's also a resistance to Frost that developed because, in part, of the Thompson biography. That is, many people said, well, he's a great poet, but it turned out, by the way Thompson represented it, that he was supposedly a bad man. So that became, as it were, the story of Thrums, the very great and skillful poet, but who was really a bad man. Uh, you know, a horrifying uh, a father and, and, a, and a terrible husband and so on and so forth. Well, now we're learning a lot more and we know a lot more that uh, this was not the case. Uh, my view is, is that what's terrifying about Frost is in the poetry. Um, and... Uh, uh, it's interesting to me that many people do take the poetry, many people do take the poems uh, the wrong way. Uh, that there's a kind of doubleness to them, that they have a kind of surface appeal uh, that uh, uh, hides uh, a much greater complexity. Now, I think this has a lot to do with his immense skill. Uh, I think it takes an enormous amount of skill to have that combination of clarity and depth. Uh, and the skill of the poetry, the, the, the ability to uh, evoke uh, plates and the ability to evoke characters, uh, the ability to evoke voice uh, and sound is, is utterly remarkable. Uh, but... Uh, I think Frost has always had an immensely uh, strong following among poets, uh, even if academic critics have often thought that he's either too simple or that in some ways he's contextually very difficult because he doesn't fit into a movement. He's just not readily, contextually readily available. Well, uh, let me just talk then about what I would say are the three basic strains of Frost poetry, at least technically. There are the long poems where a story is told that go on for maybe 500 lines, 300 to seven, 800 lines, where, you know, Death of the Hired Man is probably the most famous one. Uh, and then there are the short little epigrammatic poems, eight lines or under. But for me, the, 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 for us at his best is those poems that are between, say, 10 
lines and maybe a page to a page and a half in length, those uh, classic lyric poems. Uh, do you, when you've looked through the poems, or did Frost uh, see sort of three different types of poems, or was he going back and forth, writing a long poem, then writing a lot of epigrammatic poems, then writing a lyric poem? There's an immense variety uh, in, in Frost's poetry in terms of, of the kind of form that you're talking about. Uh, his first book, A Boy's Will, is filled mostly with those shorter lyrics that you're talking about. Uh, in North of Boston, he includes these narrative slash dramatic poems uh, that are a real breakthrough. Uh, nobody had quite seen anything like that since Virgil. Uh, I mean, there had been poets who had written pastoral uh, poems and epilogues, for example, Spencer. Uh, the Shepherd's Calendar, uh, but Ross really uh, developed the pastoral uh, eclogue poem in in a, in a boy's world. So you, you get, I mean, in the in the north of Boston, so that you get uh, poems that are uh, traditional lyrics, if, if such a word as traditional can be used in the case of Frost, traditional lyrics such as "After Apple Picking," which is uh, a stunning lyric poem. Uh, in the midst of such dramatic poems as you mentioned, The Death of a Hunter Man, or Men's Wall, or uh, a Home Burial, which is a, which is a, you know, a, a stunning uh, a work of, uh, of, of uh, psychological insight. So uh, I think that those eclogue poems deserve much more attention that they've, they've gotten from the critics. Uh, I, I think the critics haven't quite known how to read them. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're they're hybrid, they're 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 narrative, they're lyric, and they're um, dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that Frost is very good writing short lyrics. He is he's brilliant at writing uh, epig uh, epigrams and uh, uh, almost couplet short couplet poems. And, and and I think he's great at writing these kind of dramatic poems. You know I. A, lot, a poet that I've always seen sort of linked to Frost, but I know very few people would uh, say so, would be Robinson Jeffers, who came a few years after Frost, because both of them often dealt with what would people would call dark themes, and they would write these longer narrative poems. Certainly Jeffers was more operatic, uh, obviously operatic, yeah. than Frost. But it seems to me that there's a strain of Frost within Jeffers. Uh, do you think that there have that Frost's influence uh, by critics has been uh, often underplayed because I, I think that Jeffers, if you look at the poems he wrote in his first couple of books like Californians, then, you know, which came out around the same time as Frost's earliest stuff, then Frost comes along and then Jeffers really changes. I, I, I mean, I don't know if, if Jeffers read some of these uh, Death of the Hired Man or, or, or things like that, but it seems to me that there was certainly some kind of knowledge by Jeffers of Frost, what he was doing. And Jeffers said, you know, I'm going to do something like that, but go a little bit beyond, you know, operatically. That's very interesting. I don't know uh, how much Jeffers was specifically interested in Frost. Frost was interested in Jeffers. Yeah. And he mentions Jeffers in, uh, for example, A Mask of Mercy. Mm. And he also mentions in him in the poem Art to Bloom. Um, in which he quotes uh, he quotes a line from Jeffers as the epigram of the poem. Um, so uh, that is the, the phrase he quotes is from Jeffers' poem, Shine, Perishing Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I think that Frost, uh, Frost saw in Jeffers, and I'm told by a, a student of Frost uh, that he, Frost once made the remark about Jeffers, that he's crude but accurate, mm. which is a very interesting thing if Ross said it. Because in a way, Jeffers is a little more direct than Frost about the darkness of things, as it were. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Frost, Frost would suggest, say, a hand holding a knife, whereas Jeffers would have that bloody hand and the exactly. blood dripping. Exactly. You know, he, that's a very good way of putting it. Uh, it's a very good way of putting it. Uh, you know, there were, Frost is extraordinarily subtle, mm -hmm. which is which is why you know he's I think so so easily misunderstood. 
Uh, whereas Jeffers, people do get the sense that there's something terrifying going on. You know, a very interesting case in this is the is the uh, modern Polish poet uh, Czesław Miłosz. Miłosz was a tremendous admirer of Jeffers and wrote several essays about it. Because Miłosz, as you may know, lived in California for most of the second half of his life. Uh, and he found Jeffers a very powerful poet, but one whose vision of nature was ultimate and, and of human life was ultimately uh, too dark for him to, to handle, mm -hmm. uh, too dark for him to abide by. And he thought the same thing about Frost. It's just that he felt that Frost was dissembling, that Frost was putting on a kind of act, and that Jeffers wasn't. So if you look at, at, at Milos on Jeffers and Frost, uh, he, he admires both. That he admires Frost greatly for his skill, but he doesn't like, as he doesn't like in Jeffers, this, this extraordinarily, what he considers to be inhuman way of looking at the world. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, I think that's very telling about Frost. I think European writers have been much better at, at seeing what Frost is about than American writers and critics have. For example, uh, Bro Joseph Brodsky had a very good sense of, of what Frost was like in many respects, uh, in other respects not, but he had a sense of the terror in Frost, uh, as did Derek Walcott, as did Seamus Haney. So, uh, uh, as did Milosh. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, I hope that answers your question a little bit, uh, but yeah. I think the Jeffers connection is a very interesting one indeed. Yeah. Well, uh, let me turn back to something I'd mentioned a bit earlier about uh, uh, some of the poems of Frost that uh, latterly have been looked at again uh, and, and sort of looked at, uh, I think, with fresher eyes. Um, I'll get to the, the the big one that I want to get to a little bit more in deep, but uh, just going, having written a list, uh, you know, stopping by woods on a snowy evening is one. The oven bird, uh, the figure in the doorway, um, and uh, design too, which I think is often thought too much about the spider in the poem, whereas uh, I think death, uh, you know, is there and is, is being addressed more than the spider, but of course. The, the poem that seems to be the most misinterpreted, and not only is it misinterpreted, but even people who say that it's misinterpreted then go further to misinterpret it, is uh, The Road Not Taken. And I find it interesting because a few weeks ago when we were setting this up, I, I looked up uh, to, to that, that poem. And of course, uh, you know, in, initially it's taken as uh, uh, that this is a person who's going to make a choice and my they made the choice that no one else make they weren't playing it safe and and whatnot. That was the initial thought about the poem, and then yes. every and then everyone goes on and there are now literally dozens of videos on YouTube explaining that no, this is really about uh, a poem about regret because uh, the roads are really the same and the person is regretting having made a choice at all. But when I read that and I'm a good damn poetry critic, I don't see regret at all. This is a poem about self delusion. The speaker is clearly saying that these roads are basically the same. And when I come back years from now and think about this, I want to say to myself that I made the wise choice, that I stood out from the crowd, but I know I really didn't. And yet I see very few people getting that. So there's a, a sense that you get people misinterpreted this poem initially. They have now re reinterpreted, misinterpreted more modernly, and they still don't, I think, really get what that poem is about. And let me just use that as sort of the blueprint of the misunderstood Frost. Let's talk a little bit about that poem and any other poems like I've mentioned or you might want to mention about where well, Frost has been misinterpreted. You, 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 may, uh, you may know uh, David Orr's book about, uh, about The Road Not Taken. Um, no, but, uh, he, he's a poetry critic who wrote a book just about The Road Not Taken and how it is an, a, a, a greatly misunderstood hmm. poem. Just came out a couple of years ago, and uh, it's an interesting book, uh, and I think it suggests, as you do, that there are many interpretations. Um, I, I think that, uh, or, or, or that the poem inspires many different interpretations. I mean, just the title alone, "The Road Not Taken," could be the road that he, that nobody else took, or it could be 
as 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 others have suggested, um, regret for the road not taken. Uh, so that just in the title itself, there's a kind of ambiguity. Uh, but uh, uh, the way the poem reads, yes, the speak could be, as you say, uh, very self-deluded uh, and thinking that um, uh, you know he's making some great choice uh, and, and and then asserting that he hoped in some day as you someday in the future to be looking back and saying, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads divert in a yellow wood and I, and then the dash, I took the one less traveled by. So that's something that he proposes to be saying in the future, not something that he's able to assert in the present. Yeah. And I think you're right about that. Uh, but here's an interesting question. Why with a sigh? You know, I'm under what circumstances does one say such things with a sigh? Well, I think there, there's the doubling of the I, I hyphen I, or I, I dash I. Yeah. And usually when, when people, and I, if I were to write an essay on this, I would say, when people do that I, they're reinforcing themselves. You know, I, I, you know, if someone who's scared yes. and wants to stand up to the bully will say, well, I, yes. I'm going to do it. So I think that's the speaker reinforcing his own self-motivation, uh, whatever there may be, delusion yes. or not. Yes. No, I think that I, I mean I, I think that's very interesting. Mm. Uh, now, uh, the oven bird is is a, is a wonderfully complex sonnet, uh, and uh, the subject matter is interesting because Frost was a very astute observer of the natural world. Um, he knew that oven birds sang the little song, uh, the North American oven bird anyway sings the little song, teacher, teacher, teacher. Uh, but uh, what's so interesting, uh, or there's so many things that are interesting about that poem, um, uh, the oven bird paired, he paired the poem with Hyla, Hyla Brook. And it turns out that, that the oven bird and uh, uh, Hyla frogs, for which uh, the Hyla Brook takes its name, um, are both figure prominently in one of Frost's favorite books. Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of illusion there, or signaling that some of what he's talking about in those poems is the human relationship to the natural world and the nature of the natural world. Mm -hmm. And in the oven bird, there was a very complex relationship to the the, uh, the natural world. Uh, he, the speaker, seems to be able to interpret what the bird song is. He knows what the bird song means. And, and, and at some level, Frost had a sense that uh, there are sounds that in nature that are, in a way, uh, a part of our uh, collective uh, human uh, uh, ancestral uh, and deep ancestral heritage that we can understand. Yet in another sense, we, we don't understand them very well. Uh, that that, that the, the bird may have a deeper sense of what is happening in nature than even we can perceive. So the bird says many things. It says the highway dust is overall, perhaps a suggestion that um, uh, uh, human building and creation uh, is an interference with nature, that it, it, it creates problems for other species. You know, something that we may not be conscious of, but the bird is conscious of. You know, he also knows that even birds build their nest on the grounds, and they build uh, build their nest on the ground, and that they, the nest is a uh, looks like a human house with a little entry in it. So th there's something going on in that poem about the very complex relationship of human consciousness to consciousness of ne of, of non-human otherness. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the thing, too, just to get back to the road not taken and, and the idea of regret is one of the things I think in most of Frost's poems, when he has the universal I as the speaker, uh, that speaker, even if it's different personae, almost never has regrets. It's, it's it, His characters seem to see, be like icebreakers, and they keep moving forward. They keep moving forward in the poems. Sometimes when you have in some of the longer poems, you have maybe a woman or a child speaking or whatnot, they will differentiate uh, uh, psychologically. But 
I, I think in virtually every poem that I can recall, every major poem certainly uh, of Froese, when there is the universal I as the speaker, that person is very sure of where they are, what they're doing, what they are saying, how and how they proceed. And when the poem ends, even if there's death involved, it's sort of a shrug of the shoulders and, you know, let's go on. Well, I do think there is a, a sense in Frost of wanting to go on, uh, you know, not being able to go on. You know, as he says in A Leaf Treader, you know, now up my need to keep on top of another year's, I think it's a, a, a Leaf Treader, uh, now up my need to keep on top of another year of snow. Uh, you know, there's a sense that even though th there is tremendous waste in the way the world operates, and there is tremendous uh, sorrow, that he does not want to give in to it. And, and I do think that that is something about Frost himself that comes through in all the poems. That is this, this very strong sense of wanting to overcome fear. But if you look at, for example, After Apple Picking, which I think is one of his greatest lyrics, there is tremendous uh, struggle in that poem, a tremendous doubt. You know, his poem ends where just some human sleep. Uh, you know, what is he just, why did just some human sleep? Uh, why persist on the ladder when all, all other creatures have gone to hibernate for the winter? You know, there is something of both uh, ennobling and also almost insane about Frost's sense of persistence in the, in the, in the face of, of, uh, of adversity. Yeah. So I, I think the real tension there. One of the things that I think is a major problem with criticism these days is the lack of most critics these days in this politically correct uh, identity art based world is that we don't have a sense of objectivity and we don't have a sense of differentiating between what we like and what is good. Uh, for example, I put Frost in the same category as a filmmaker like Ingmar Bergman. I don't sort of emotionally like his poems, but I admire the hell out of them. And the, the really great ones, you know, I love in that intellectual sense of, wow, this does this. I, you know, I, wanted, I want to see how, I want to find out the workings of it. Do you, think, do you think that that attitude, that pervasive attitude, has had something to do with the last half century or so since his death of a, a need to sort of denigrate for us? Because it seems to me for us... Uh, you know, it, these dead white males and we have to always denigrate them rather than looking at the quality of what the man wrote. And because well, Frost is not, uh, is more complex than at first thought, he's not likable. And, and because he's not likable in modern critical circles, that means we have to sort of cut him down. Well, I think there's a lot of cutting down in modern criticism. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the criticism um, is an attempt to show how the uh, author, a group of authors, is really symptomatic of a kind of cultural disease. Mm -hmm. um, that is, you know, whether it be white maleness or some other uh, set of blinders. Um, and and what, what, what critics often attempt to show is how uh, the author both participates in certain cultural ideas, and also at, at their best, maybe somehow critical, or as critics like to say, how they interrogate uh, uh, those values. Um, there is a, a problem with political correctness. There always has been with Frost. Uh, early on, people knew that Frost was against or had deeply skeptical of the New Deal. So, uh, uh, Frost's inability to be in the 30s especially, to be a fellow traveler with intellectuals who are going to the very far left, stuck with him and with those critics and, and, and subsequent critics. That is, Frost was seen generally as someone who was not politically liberal yeah. enough, the way, let's say, Whitman is perceived to be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Frost is, he's a... Uh, you know, as you say, he's he's a white, he's white, he's a male, uh, uh, he's heterosexual. Uh, so but he wasn't it, one of he wasn't one of the fugitive poets either. It should be stated he wasn't someone who was obviously against uh, the lower classes or minorities or or whatnot. He wasn't you know the band of the fugitive poets either. Yet 
to read to read some mo more modern criticism of the man as the man, not only as a, an artist. One would think that a lot of people think that he, they would sort of sort of lump him as he thought that way. Right. That his thinking is way too complicated, even on a political level, to be categorized. As a matter of fact, I don't think enough careful work has been done to sort out for us politics. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that Frost uh, had a sense of human excellence uh, that could be very undemocratic. He once joked, he said, I'm, a, I'm an egalitarian. I, I like to associate only with my equals. You know, I, I mean, it's, it, it's funny. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he wasn't the, the uh, all-loving uh, 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 poet of democracy. Mm -hmm. That that uh, maybe some people wanted him to be, or wish wish uh, wish that he was. Uh, so I think some of that enters into critical attitudes toward Frost. But I think there are also many critics who recognize Frost as a very great, very very great poet. Uh -huh. um, another poet that I often associate with him, although he's again uh, uh, intellectually and spiritually more Whitman is Carl Sandburg. They were sort of the two great old men of poetry in the mid 20th century, these two white haired guys. I mean, Frost, Frost eventually got, you know, uh, the Kennedy poem and whatnot, and Sandburg had, had wrote his Lincoln bio, and he won a couple of Pulitzers, I think, for the bio and, and for his collected poems. Um, and yet, I think there's a lot in terms of the subject matter when they talk about the earth and, and the men with calloused hands and the people who work the sod, that kind of thing. Uh, do you see any connections between the men, at least thematically, in their poetry? No. No? Um, I see them. Well, you know, Frost, Frost is not romantic about labor. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think he sees labor as, as, as a, a very complex thing. Uh, as he as he writes in in mowing, the fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. But he is he is not a cele uh, celebrator of the worker, as it were, uh, and that comes through uh, in in for example uh, two tramps in mud time. Um, so I think that Frost thought that uh, uh, he he didn't have a kind of patronizing or condescending view toward. Uh, uh, toward the worker, I, I think Sandberg is a, is. Uh, I think Frost views Sandberg as a kind of saphead, you know, as a kind of sentimentalist. Uh, so I, I, I can see how they get the two people, two poets get confused in people's minds, but when you read them, they are light years apart. Let me talk about uh, science. You've mentioned uh, uh, Frost and science and his relationship with Darwin. Um, was you know. Frost was not what I would guess consider an overtly spiritual writer in the sense that, you know, he was an evangelist of some sort. But you get a sense that he thinks he, that there is a ghost in the machine uh, somewhere in his, his cosmic view. What was Frost's relationship to science? Was he someone who looked forward to the coming age? You know, was he someone looking forward to bigger, better things? Or was he ultimately a pessimist, do you think? Well, I think I think that he was uh, a rugged pessimist. That is, I, I don't think that Frost thought that there was such a thing as progress. Um, I, I think he was particularly skeptical of of uh, Marxist ideas of progress, and uh, he's very critical of Marxism in that sense. But uh, in 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 relation to science, I think he admired science tremendously. Because science was a great adventure, as he called it, uh, a penetration of the ethereal mind of man into the material uh, of, of the universe. And, and I think he thought that that adventure, the mind's plunge of the ethereal into the material, what was a very exciting thing. And uh, uh, so I think he saw, you know, and he was a, an avid botanist. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was a very learned botanist. Uh, great amateur botanist, um, and, and the poems reveal that when he mentions a flower, a particular flower, a particular plant, or a particular tree, he knows exactly what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. He's a great observer, uh, not unlike uh, 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 the way Thoreau was. Uh, and of course, he was a great admirer of Thoreau's. 
So uh, the question is, what do you find out about the world from science? Um, and, and design is a very good example of a poem of someone observing nature in, in, in its very small particulars, the way uh, a good naturalist would, and then trying to come to some kind of conclusion about how, what this suggests about the way the universe works, and uh, finding that uh, our theories, you know, shouldn't be held too long. That our theories, for example, a theory that any kind of uh, set of observations reveal to us design in nature may be the projection of our design onto nature. Hmm. Let me uh, ask about. Uh, 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 you, you you sort of suggested that Frost looked upon someone like Sandberg as sort of a rube or a bumpkin. And uh, nowadays we have a lot of simplistic ideas that are propounded about art. Some of them are ancient. Art is truth. Art is beauty. All art is political. It seems to me uh, that Frost would implicitly reject these kind of bumper sticker mentalities Absolutely. about art. What What was his bedrock credo, if you will, or observation about art. Art, certainly, I think he would say he's writing about his view of the world, but was he trying to communicate something of uh, a spiritual nature, uh, about the workings of the world, the, the wisdom that's I, out there? I, I think I think there are several phrases that Frost used that are very evocative of what, what he thought about art. In the uh, wonderful preface he wrote to the Complete Poems, 1949, Frost says, um, uh, a poem begins in delight and ends in wisdom. Mm. Uh, so there's something of a sense there of, of a poem ha providing some kind of wisdom. And, uh, uh, and he also says in, in that essay uh, that, that a poem provides a momentary stay against confusion. Uh, and I think that that is, for him, the essence of what art does. It provides just a momentary stay against confusion, a kind of form against which to fight chaos. Mm -hmm. So that the creation of form uh, uh, of any kind, and, and I would look also in, in, in this way to uh, uh, the, the little essay he wrote, Letter to the Amherst Student, which was really a letter to the Amherst Student newspaper. Uh, which is an excellent little essay on um, uh, in, in which he talks about this notion of, uh, of of the poem being any kind of little point of order laid against a background of darkness and confusion. So I think that's the way he saw art as a momentary stay against confusion. I don't think he made great spiritual claims. For art. In, in the in the essay, uh, another great essay, uh, uh, education by poetry, which is about metaphor, uh, he talks about uh, uh, poetry as uh, enthusiasm taped by metaphor. Hmm. Uh, metaphor is a way of helping us perceive the world, but only it is only temporary. Yeah. It is it is something that has to be dealt with uh, as. Uh, So he sort of had a utilitarian view of art that it can help in certain moments, but it's not a credo necessarily to live no. one's life by. No. Um, let's talk then about uh, the last 50 or so years uh, plus since his death and uh, where his reputation has gone. Um, is Frost, as far as you know, one of the more widely translated American poets worldwide? I mean, is he is he the American equivalent to say what Pablo Neruda is to you know Latin American poets? Well, I think Whitman probably takes the uh, title for the most widely translated yeah. and disseminated uh, American poem, yeah. uh, primarily because he might be easier to translate in some yeah. respects. Yeah. Uh, anyone who writes in the kind of meters uh, and form that Frost did is going to be harder to translate into another language. Now, I'm not saying that, that the rhythms of Whitman's free verse lines are always easy to translate, but there, there are, in Frost, you're dealing with, you know, tremendous formal skill yeah. that, that, that's very hard to render into another language. Mm -hmm. Plus the tone. There's so much in Frost that's about the tone. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's very hard to realize mm -hmm. uh, in, in another language without fixing it. However, Frost has been widely translated. 
Uh, I know he's also very popular in Asia, yeah. in China, um, uh, uh, so in uh, Japan. So uh, there is a great deal of, of global interest in Frost, uh, but uh, uh, you know he, he does sort of remain a kind of American phenomenon. Uh, do you think then, at least then here in America, let's stick to America then, uh, do you think then that he's gone through those sort of uh, post-mortem ups and downs and that pretty much now, uh, you know, no one's going to really touch Frost in terms of the, the, the critical uh, uh, reputation that Frost is part of the canon, period, like it or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Frost is here to stay. Yeah. He is an enormous... He's an enormous figure, and, and is, is the, the enormity of his achievement, will, I think, will only continue to, to grow. Um, uh, I think he's here to stay. I think that there has been already uh, a transformation in recognizing that Frost is very complicated, uh, that uh, Frost is very complicated poetically, politically, uh, biographically, um, and uh, he has a... a well deserved, very wide readership outside of the academy, mm-hmm. you know, and people remember his poems, and that's very important. Yeah, we uh, we talked earlier about how recently uh, Whitman had a an early novel discovered. Is there anything left in the first corpus? And certainly, you've written books about it, so I guess you might have had access more than most people that you know will shine any kind of light. Or do we basically know? For us, the man, for us, the poet, for us, the thinker. I mean, is, is there anything that could come to light, say, an early novel or something? Well, I don't think so. I think that there could always be more letters. Uh-huh. Uh, there might be some more early notebooks that appear eventually. But I don't think we're going to find uh, a major manuscript mm-hmm. that's going to alter our perception of Frost. Uh, having said that, I've spent a good part of my life studying Frost, and I'd be the first one to say, I don't really know him. You know, he's just that that complicated. Well, um, let me just ask, uh, uh, as a summing up then, uh, to any younger readers, people just encountering Frost, what things would you recommend uh, that they, uh, you know, be aware of and, and look for in Frost that they may not get with a Whitman or a Jeffers or... Uh, you know, Robert Hayden or, or Malay or whomever? I, I think with Frost, you have to be on alert always for the tone of a poem or the tones within a poem. And you have to, a, a, a reader should be, take great care to read Frost out loud and think about the tone with which someone speaks in one of his poems and psychologically what word do to other people. Uh, you know, in Home Burial, uh, 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 Amy and her husband are, are doing things to each other with what they say. What is happening psychologically in that poem? Uh, people need to be pay attention to the tone. And people need to pay attention to the, uh, uh, the psychological insight that, that, that's there. Well, I want to thank Robert uh, Fagan for spending uh, some time talking about Robert Frost. I will link to his webpage at uh, Claremont. McKenna College. Uh, anyone uh, interested in finding out more about his own books, uh, a lot of them on Robert Frost can uh, look up his stuff there. Uh, is there a, a final, uh, though, a final, I guess, a word uh, of, of advice or, or caution that you would, uh, anything you want to say about Frost before we end? Just just Frost's own couplet that he, he published in his last book, In Clearing, uh, it goes, it takes all sorts of in and outdoor schooling to get adapted to my kind of fooling. That's a good thing to keep in mind when reading Frost. Well, again, thank you, and I'll link to your website, and uh, you have a good day, Robert. Thank you very much, Dan.